Anybody broken by their circumstances? Circumstances? My health is good. Emotionally, I'm okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm broken. And thank God Jesus is the shepherd to the shattered. He will build you up. He will strengthen you. And we have to remind ourselves of this. I just read this this morning. Jeremiah, many of you know the, the weeping prophet. Jeremiah. He said, since my people are crushed, I am crushed. Don't you feel like that sometimes in our nation? Since, since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there, there no healing for the wound of my people? Now he's not talking about actual balm, physical balm, but spiritual balm in this case. There, there actually was a, a balm of Gilead for physical healings. And it's interesting in holistic medicine, and, and I won't get into all that, but you, there are many plant-based phytochemicals that can really lead to the body healing itself and different things. But anyway, um, so he, he's lamenting here and you see this beautiful promised land. They were going into the promised land. They had to carry grapes like this. Two men. They saw this bountiful area and now this, broke, this beautiful place is now a broken, deserted place because they have drifted from God. And, and I feel his tears, don't you? I, I'm crushed because the people are crushed. I mourn. There's, there, there's horror grips me. There's no balm in Gilead. There's no physician. Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? And so instead of putting this on the end, I want to talk about this up front. I actually did release a podcast on this. You can listen to, but when does God heal? Why doesn't he heal? What, what's the, 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 the boundaries here, Shane? How, how does this work? And of course, I, I need a whole sermon on healing, but I think there's some important things to talk about because many of you are in a broken place right now. And these points can apply to spiritual things, emotional things, your circumstances. And something just in me gets a little upset sometimes when I, when I watch you know, people on television or uh, just go to certain events where it's just, if you just have enough faith, if you, have a, if, you just have, if you just have enough faith, you come up here, you will be healed if you just have enough faith. Now, isn't that somewhat true? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Jesus could not do many works there because of their unbelief. Have faith is a mustard seed. But the, the problem with saying that is you've got to make sure you cover some under other areas. Because Scripture says faith, believe, you will receive. But it also says sin can cause disease. Or could God be teaching you through it? Could it be according to His sovereign plan? So we just can't, we can't label it with one solution because I take it to the Lord. It, what, about if, is it, what about if it's demonic activity? Is faith going to heal you if there's a demonic stronghold that has to be dealt with so there's so many different things that can happen so i want to just help you in this area it's, it's been a tremendous help for me because like you i've struggled through this this whole area before praying for people uh, and seeing some people healed some people not and and so we have to remember one thing at the top of the list a beautiful word i'm going to talk about sovereignty sin satan stewardship and seeking these were all added just this morning, so they're not going to be up there. Sovereignty. We have to remember this when it comes to God breaking, God repairing those who are broken and, and getting you back to that beautiful state. There's something about God's sovereignty. So let's say, why am I not being healed? Or why is a person not being healed? Could it be that God and His sovereignty is doing something? How many people have come to a deeper, deeper relationship with the Lord because of their affliction. How many? Paul, Paul had an ailment. Something was going on. I mean, it could have been a demonic uh, issue there. We don't really know. He said, I pray three times. And if we got into the text, it's really interesting that a messenger of Satan has, has buffeted my flesh leads me to believe that that could be a, a demonic type of thing. And maybe, you know, people question his eyesight. And, and God said, after three times of praying for it, my grace is sufficient. Paul was not healed. Paul. Do, do we get that? 
So I think it's really help, helpful, helpful to have a mental picture of what, what healing really is. First, does it fall under God's sovereignty? I don't know. I don't know either. That's why we seek Him when we find out and we keep pressing in. We keep having faith. We keep asking. But that's so important because with sovereignty comes teaching and timing. Has God ever taught you through difficulties? The sickness? Teaching and timing. Sin. Sin can stop the healing power of God. What I appreciate last night and when Yvette mentioned it is if you're, if you're holding on to bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, a lot of those things can be toxic emotions. They, how, they, how they release adrenaline, how they, how they release these things in your body. They're actually bad for your body, believe it or not. Cortisol is rushing and, 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 just, and you're holding on to these things and, and, and how much of it is, or sin, if, if there's a besetting sin and God is, is chastising you to lead you to repentance. So if I just say, hey, come up here, have enough faith, you'll be healed. God says, no, hold on, Shane. Mm-mm, mm-mm. He's got to deal with the sin in his life. Paul said, why are some of you sick and dead? Because you've taken the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So if you balance out all the Scripture, healing to me makes, makes a lot of sense. Because you don't get frustrated when one little thing doesn't, doesn't work. Or what about James? Go to the elders. Let the elders pray over you. Anoint you with oil. And if it's a sin, if it's, if it's a sickness caused by sin, you'll be healed because you're confessing. So we have to be just careful in this area. So sovereignty, sin can prevent it. A Satan demonic and how do we know shane what it is well you take it to the lord in prayer and fasting and i believe he's showed people before i've got a demonic stronghold i need to deal with uh he, he's showed those things to me before like you know this is this is something when you know it's something you just can't beat it's beating you when it's continually harassing when it's more than just a temptation there's a stronghold there that is really ruling and reigning in your life this is going to take some serious work and so you have to deal with that satanic type of stronghold. What about that woman bent over? Remember? Can you imagine? Why? Have you seen those people walk like that? It's terrible. And they're walking. Why should this woman, a child of Abram, who has been bound, think of it, these 18 years, not be set free by the power of the gospel? And Jesus said, woman, thou art loosed from your infirmities. And she stood up straight. Had nothing to do with her faith. And then we could get real in, into some interesting texts about you being intercessors. How many people were healed in the Bible that weren't even praying? Weren't even exercising their faith? They're sick. They're about ready to die. The man finds Jesus. Jesus, come quick. Okay, I'll come with you. No, no, no. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. I'm a man in authority and under authority. And if I just speak this word, they will be healed. So you see all the interse- what, the power of intercession. Could somebody be set free tonight by your prayers? I don't. I'm a. I'm a, just a guy that believes the Bible. Call me a simple man. Call me uneducated, but I believe the Word of God, and there's power in believing in God's Word. Now hold on, buckle up, and sit down. It might get a little convicting. Stewardship. Stewardship of this. If our lifestyle causes disease, if our lifestyle choices cause disease, I think one of the top things I pray for a lot around the last 10 years is is type 2 diabetes. And I believe God can set free. I believe He can heal right then. I remember a gentleman who was going for heart surgery, I believe, and we prayed and his arteries were clean and, and he was not in good shape physically and God just did a miraculous thing. And so I, I never doubt that. But we also have to remember that if we don't steward our bodies correctly, di- type 2 diabetes is actually diet related. So we can pray, but how do you know that the, 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 the healing is not going to come from different choices about stewarding our body? How, how, do, how do we know that? 
I mean, I've been praying, you know, I'll share it maybe at the health seminar and I, I leaked out a little bit, but I've been praying, you know, for probably two years now and just my eyesight getting better, my foot stopped falling asleep, sweating, different things. And I look up, it's, it's, it's the, like the top signs of diabetes are coming. Like, well, hello, me of all people. But I know why. Getting a little slack and lazy, but I've been praying. I'm praying, God, God says, Shane, change your, change your lifestyle. Let your body heal itself. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that's the answer for everything. But think about it. If we're praying for things that are, life, that are caused by our lifestyle, wouldn't it make sense to change our lifestyle to lead to healing and repair? So many times I think we pray for something, we just don't want to take the action on stewarding our body or stewarding our choices or our lifestyle. I've, I've saw it so many different times now, the top diseases out there now are diet related. Did you know that? Cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, all they're diet related. They're lifestyle related. So again, we will still pray for you. We will believe it. I don't go, you know, not gonna pray. You gotta, you know, stop eating those donuts. We'll pray for cancer. We'll pray for it. And I believe it. I don't, I don't, I don't even have a doubt in my mind. But I do often sometimes I wonder, what about if God is wanting us to make some changes? And this is kind of a, a wake-up call. And so that's the whole scope of healing. You have to look at all these different things. And then the final thing I put here, seeking. Uh, to me, sometimes pain can drive us to the cross. How many of you in pain or wanting healing or breakthrough or set free or the strongholds release drives you to Jesus? Now, be careful. Many times it pushes you away. Anyone become discouraged? Defeated? So I just want to give up. This is, not going to, this is not working. God, this is not working. But if we use that, that to draw us to the cross, draw us to that deeper relationship, I, I, I sometimes thank God for the pain in my life that has happened over the years. Thank God for the pain. And most of you know, how, how, do, you, how do you build muscle? Is there pain involved? Is there pain involved with, isn't that interesting? What? That, I don't like that. I don't like that. What are you doing? You're actually tearing the muscle fibers, pain, and then they rebuild while you sleep to compensate next time for the load you're putting on them. Pain. Pain. I remember hearing a story. I don't remember what this disease is called. But this mom had a daughter who felt no pain. And she would burn her fingers. I think, I think she was missing a few fingers or things because she just didn't feel anything. She didn't feel anything. And you would think, oh, that's great. But the mom is crying and pleading, I wish my daughter felt pain. Think about that. I wish my, that was her prayer. A mom's prayer. I wish my daughter felt pain. God, please let her feel pain. See, was the pain? To, oh, that's hot. That's not a good spot to go. I don't like that. That hurts. And God will use that pain. And so what I was talking about tonight is, is the garden the Garden of Gethsemane from Matthew 26, beginning in verse 36. I want, to, I want to just read it because this is, think about this as we're reading. This beautiful place, this beautiful place that Jesus went to for three years. They said it's a Sabbath day journey from Jerusalem, which is about only a half mile because they had rules you could only travel so far. So it's a half mile up on, on the Mount of Olives, looking down at Jerusalem, this beautiful garden, Jesus would go there and commune with God. Go there maybe sometimes all night in this beautiful place. Not this evening. It's a very, very broken place. A very hard place. Then Jesus went with His disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And He said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and two sons of Zebedee along with Him and he began to be in sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with 
me. Hold on that one for a minute. The Gethsemane. You know what it means? An olive press. You think the olive press is painful for the olive? Think about that. And not until that olive is pressed and broken does the oil flow out. Oh, that's a sermon. If I had time, I could tell you about the anointing of God flowing through a broken vessel. Broken. Broken of self. Broken of pride. Emptied of self. And out of that, that brokenness comes this, this anointing oil of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't believe God will anoint a prideful person. Now, I'm not saying a person who struggles with pride. Amen? But a prideful. I got this. I can handle this. And that's why I believe many times He takes us through our different roads of brokenness. What broke you won't break me. Or maybe it will. I just didn't go through that situation. Some people, He'll break them financially. Some people, He'll break them relationally. Or a combination. Some people, he'll, he'll break them. Thank God for brokenness. Thank God for God breaking us and, and spanking us. To some, he might just embarrass you completely at work, humble you. This isn't working. And through that brokenness, you, he be, God begins to chip away that pride. Jesus would go there and and build strength. He would build up his strength, and now it became a painful place. But something really stood out. He began to be sorrowful and, and troubled to the point of death. And I thought, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more? If Jesus needed to pray, and I don't mean a quick prayer. I mean, if Jesus needed to go somewhere and communicate with God, let me tell you, as God is my witness, that is the only reason I stand before you tonight. Preaching with boldness is because of that time with God. If I lose that, I lose everything. I will just be a motivational speaker. I'll miss the fire of God, the anointing of God, the unction, the hunger for God. You miss it. That time with God, that, that fuels you up, that refills you. And I, I re recommended David McIntyre's book before, if you can get it, The Hidden Life of Prayer. And just let it change your heart. He talks about a, a quiet place, a quiet heart, and a quiet hour. Do you have all three of those? Try to. Shoot for that. And then we can continue to read, going a little further. And, and Matthew goes on to say, going a little further... He fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, my Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me. Think about that. Jesus was born to die. The fulfillment of prophecy is coming true. Golgotha, the place of the skull, the cross is coming soon. And he said, Father, can you the, basically, it's, it's the cup of God's wrath is, is Old Testament imagery. Pouring the cup of God's wrath and take this cup from me. I don't want to go through this. Nevertheless, or I believe this translation, yet, yet I will trust you. Yet, I, yet, not what I will, but what you will. I think some of you tonight need to find a nevertheless you need to find a yet. And stop, stop arguing with God. Stop fighting God and just say, nevertheless, I feel this way, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to seek you. Then He returned to His disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with Me for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The Spirit is willing but the flesh is weak isn't that interesting the famous verse many people know this verse they've heard this verse it has to do with praying wait a minute could praying strengthen me spiritually is it could that be the key i'm missing could that be the engine that runs my train 
Could that or drives my car or what? I mean, could that could that be the missing ingredient? Could that be the missing element? And I'll tell you, if you're getting more social media than time with God, you will be influenced in a, in a very unhealthy direction. Fear, anxiety, what's going on? That time with God is, is so important. But this this is maybe it's me, but this is amazing. He fell on his face. Our Lord and Savior fell on his face. And so here's here's my point I talk about often. Our posture does reflect our heart often. And so when we give out calls, you know, come to the altar, it's not just to come. there's There's a posture that resembles the brokenness we're feeling. And if there's no posture, if there's no if there's no reaction, you gotta wonder, is my heart even engaged? I mean, if you think what our state is considering, you think about the, the decadence of our family, you think what Disney is trying to promote, you think of the, the perversion, what's trying to be pushed on our kids, there should be a, there should be a, a, a heaviness to, to fall on the ground. And see, it's not the falling or the alt, it's, it's just, but there should be a positioning, correct? A positioning. You lose everything tomorrow, I guarantee you'll be on the, on the floor crying. See, there's a, there's a position. Many of us just don't have, have the heart of Christ within us. We don't feel the compassion of God. And that compassion will drive you to a posture. I'll tell you this last week of prayer, I've been just really pressing in. And you feel you feel the, the, the weight of what's going on. You feel that the time clock is ticking. And, and if, if there's not a mass of spiritual awakening, the Titanic has been hit. It is going down. And it, it, it just doesn't look very good for our children and our grandchildren but God doesn't say, well, who cares? Tomorrow we die. He says, no, when Zion travails, that something will be born and there's got to be a, an anguish, a call to anguish, a call to a desperation, a crying church that, that, that is truly wanting to seek the heart of the Father. There's one thing I know that God hears. He hears the cries of his children. He hears a desperate plea. He hears a yearning for more of him. <clears throat> Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Interesting. Be vigilant physically and spiritually. Because I can pray, but if I'm not watching, it, it, it reminds me really of Nehemiah. I don't know how many of you know that story, but he was rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. It's an incredible manual on leadership. I'd love to go through it sometime, especially with the men on Nehemiah. But he said, with, with one hand, we built the wall. With a trial, trial for, for concrete. And with the other hand, we held the sword. So you've got to be, you've got to, you're praying, but you're also watching. You're discerning. You're being very sensitive to what's going on. You're, you're not allowing certain things in your home or, or maybe friendships with your kids that shouldn't be friendships going on or the influence that is drawing the family away. Are you discerning what's going on in my home? What's going on in the church? What's going on in our How You're watching and praying. And our physical position can affect our spiritual outcome. Sleeping during a battle assures defeat, Correct? Fearing during battle assures retreat. And feasting during the battle assures sluggishness. See, there's always a physical posture that's going to have spiritual ramifications. Think about it. There, how much fear was, was out there over the last two years? I mean, and I understand, so please understand what I'm not saying is coming from a condescending heart. I'm not in their position, so I don't really know, but talking to so many, let's say, nurses or doctors I know or uh, teachers, oh man, I can't say anything. I will, what? Lose my job, get fired. How many sheriffs can't really say anything about the vaccine mandate because might get fired? Or firemen. I know firemen, there's a lawsuit with, with the vaccines. And, 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 and so, but I understand it. I mean, I don't think we should just, I don't care if I get fired, who cares? I mean, you got, you got, there's got to be wisdom there. God's got to be, God's got to be giving you some discernment and maybe how can you have it make a, a difference internally? But you see how, how defeating fear was. 
And you see so many churches afraid, afraid to talk about what was really going on. I mean, there's a lot of shenanigans that was going on with this virus and things. It was, hey, these antibodies work. No, it can't use anti- antibodies. Hey, this really work. No, it can't use that. You have to just use this. You have to use that. You have to controlling, manipulating false narratives. News outlets owned by like six people. Do you know all your news outlets pretty much are owned by six people, six organizations that are not good people, and they will control a narrative and saying the same thing. And so using discernment, using wisdom. And, but I do know this, brokenness paves the way to the nearness of the Savior. Brokenness paves the way to the fullness of the Spirit. And, and I looked into this. I actually read a book by a shepherd. Uh, and I did searches and you, know, and you get one side and not the other. And somebody, some other side says, well, no, that really doesn't happen. But let's just say tradition holds that many times or sometimes a, a, a shepherd would actually break the leg of a lamb that continually wandered from the flock. Or he would tie something to it. Why? Because that wandering sheep would be met by disaster. And so once that leg was broken or splint, he would then carry that sheep, that lamb, on his shoulders. And through that broken and dependent relationship, he would begin to trust the shepherd. And so could it be that God is breaking many of you? Many people listening. Maybe breaking us by what's going on. You know, if if all this stuff wasn't going on, I'd hate to see how prideful the church would be. Think about if the president you wanted was in office. COVID was gone. Real estate's great. Everything's going great. Do you think we'd be really seeking God like never before? Well, I already know the answer. And so through this brokenness, this broken, dependent relationship, Jesus, You are my sufficient Savior. You are my everything right now. You, you begin to... He holds you. And, and could it be when your leg is healed and He puts you down that you don't stray too far anymore? The blessing of brokenness. The blessing of brokenness. And let me tell you, it's a lifelong struggle. It's a lifelong People, Somebody asked me, well, so when, when way back when you got, like, when did God break you? Well, yesterday. <laughs> last week. Last month. And I'm sure He's going to do it again. Those he loves, he disciplines, chastises. That word that you look up, it's not a whip and things like that. It's a, it's a loving rebuke. Those he loves, he will rebuke. Because he loves you. He loves me. And so the blessing of brokenness, can you imagine if we... Here's what the enemy wants you to do with your brokenness. Throw a pity party. Can you relate? Woe is me. And then with a pity party, there's no effectiveness. There's no ministry. There's no helping others. But if you take that brokenness and you turn it, God turns it into an unbreakable force, then you're ministering to others. Then you're helping others. Then you're on fire for God. Then you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if you have brokenness, that brokenness that was sent to destroy you, remember I said the other last time, the storm that was sent to break you might be the storm that God's going to use to make you. And so you focus in the right direction. You focus that brokenness and that hurting and that pain, that addiction. You focus it back on Christ. And and through that broken and dependent relationship, listen, I realize I come up here as a broken, shattered man. And if God does not speak boldly through me and ignite my heart and guide me with the Holy Spirit and let the Word come alive, it will fall on deaf ears. It won't be a living church. It will be a dead church. And we have enough of those. The blessing of brokenness. And so this continued to break my heart as I read. We'll keep going to the next screen. He went away. He went away a second time. I never saw this before. I never saw this before until this week. I've read it, the New Testament, I think 50 times now. But we all, you know, I know Jesus asked that this, this cup be taken away. And I thought, you know, that was, and I never realized 
he asked what it says here, he went away a second time and prayed. Again, my father, if it is not possible, in other words, is it possible for this cup to be taken away? Do, do I have to drink of it? Do I have to go to Calvary? Do I have to be beaten? Do I have to be mocked? Do I have to be scorned? Do I have to have that crown of thorns just placed on my head? And, and is the creation really going to crucify their creator? And do I have to go through that anguish? The, 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 I, I, Father, please take this cup from me. Nevertheless, your will be done. And so you see the humanity in Jesus. You see the humanity and, and, and that desperation, but you also see the, the love of, of, of God and His love for us. And when He came back, He found them sleeping. How many of us are sleeping when we should be wide awake saying, King Jesus, I am here. I will do business until you return. What can I do? I will watch and I will pray. Oh, don't find me sleeping. Don't find me. Like they says, be careful that day come upon you unexpectedly like a thief in the night and you're, you're, you're carried away by drunkenness and carousing in that day come upon you unexpectedly. There's a, there, there's a, there, the, and, and sleeping, it's not necessarily eyes closed for us. And just, it is spiritually asleep. Sp and that's why I said, with the real church of Jesus Christ, please wake up out of your slumber. Would you wake up out of your slumber? The war, the, Luke, the war against lukewarm Christianity is being fought now. Would the real church please rise up? Would they play, take the rightful position and begin to do spiritual warfare? The sleeping giant is still sleeping, and you don't conquer any kingdoms when you're sleeping. Tell us smooth things like a baby. Rock us to sleep. That's what the Jeremiah said. Jeremiah 23 talked about false prophets. And the people would say, tell us smooth things. Things that are easy for our ears. And people came and they, they said things that God didn't say. And, he, and God said, I, have not, I did not send these prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, but they spoke. But had they truly stood in my counsel, they would have turned the people from the air of their way. My word is like a fire. My word is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And that's a, that's a, that's a warrior that is, that is asleep and awake. When he, when he came back, again, he found them sleeping. Their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away one more time. Are we reading this correctly? Prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and said, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So this beautiful garden now is a place of complete brokenness. But all week I was thinking, I, I, I hope I, I, again, this is just my opinion. But why, why is Jesus wanting them to watch? I mean, what, he knows his hour. Nobody needs to watch. Nobody's got Jesus' back. Like what, what's Peter going to do? Pull a sword and cut off the ear of Malchus and Jesus repairs it? And, you know, Peter, watch. Make sure you're watching me because I, you know, watch. You're my guard. You're my, you're my, you're my uh, law enforcement. You're my security. Watch, please. Or, it, it, I, I don't think it's that. It actually, what we said earlier, read earlier, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. So I think he was preparing Peter for the future. Watch and pray. Because you'll enter into temptation. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter, you, you need to learn that you watch. Be vigilant. Discipline your body. Be prepared for what is coming. Watch and pray. And so... Communion is going to be tonight up in the balcony of it as well and here during the closing songs. This is when we reflect on the cross. We remember. See, sometimes you have to remember. Think of what we take for granted. We take for granted Jesus per performing the will of the Father. He's basically saying, Father, is there any other way? Is he, is he not? Is there any other way? Is there any other path? Is there any other road? Is there any other plan B? If there was, God, now is the time to do it. The wrath of God's indignation being poured out on me. Lord, is there any other way? 
no son. There is no other way. He laid His life down willingly. And so when we take of communion, we remember the body that was broken. By my stripes you are healed. Healed. Of course, there's, spirit, there's, physical, there's physical aspects there, but healed, healed spiritually. By my stripes, my blood, you are healed. And the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And, and we remember, and, and you take your, your mind back there, and then you say like Paul, oh, that I may know Him, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and in the fellowship of His suffering to be conformed to His death, fashioned in shape in such a way that I'm willing to die for Him. So if you don't know Him tonight, I know many do, many coming on a Wednesday night, obviously believers, but a lot of people watching too. You've got to apply the blood to your life. You have to believe that Jesus died, rose again, said who He was, is the Son of God. Repent of your sin. There's no other road. There's no other way. We need to stop believing in the American Gospel. Amen? Stop believing in the American Gospel. Well, Shane, what's the American Gospel? Comfort, ease, and success. No, the Bible says suffering. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Charles Spurgeon said, cheer up, cheer up, you faint-hearted warrior. Not only has Christ traveled this road, but he has defeated your enemies. So cheer up, wipe that grin off your face, wipe that sadness from your eyes, and cheer up. This is part of the walk. If Christ carried the cross and died for your sin and was beaten beyond recognition, and he went to Calvary knowing the weight of what he was doing, how much more uh, we expect there is going to be tribulation because the enemy is against you. The world is against you. Most believers are against you when you start to really live for God. There is tribulation. There is persecution. And if we know what to expect, we can persevere. I try to be thankful. Try to be thankful. Thank you for the things we have. Thank you for running water. Thank you for this. Thank you for stock options for some of you or retirement or 401Bs or 401Cs. And, and thank you for... At the, what, that's a real thing, right? 401B? Oh, 401 Gosh. I told you you can't preach perfectly in one hour. There's a, somebody look it up sometime. There's a 401B somewhere out there. But that's the point, right? Where all these things we're counting in. Take, don't count on those things. It'd be nice, be thankful, but Lord, even if you take everything, if I don't have that retirement, if that business still doesn't work out, if everything I've been counting on doesn't work out, Lord, you are sufficient. You are my all consuming passion. So not only don't believe the American gospel, I'll close with this, don't believe the sugar-coated gospel. It is void of sin. It is void of uh, suffering. Don't believe the broad gospel that all paths lead to God. Listen, here's your struggle, you who believe all paths lead to God. And you believe Jesus at the same time. They both can't be right. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. I am not an option. I am not a few different ways. It's like a smorgasbord. I am the only way, the only life, the only truth. No man can access the Father but through me because the cross of Calvary bridged that gap between you and God. There's only one way. There is no plan B. There is no backup plan. And you will face tribulation for believing that. Praise God.